All right, y'all, turn your Bibles, please, to 2 Kings chapter 24, as we begin our study of God's Word, which is part of the spiritual growth process, worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. And just to kind of reiterate those, uh, you know, worshiping God in spirit and truth, studying His Word, and applying it to our lives, uh, loving one another and not just other Christians, and reaching the lost if we really love them. And the reason for that whole growth cycle is so that, well, we might grow to the glory of God. Let's not forget the why behind the what. You know, we're always emphasizing the what. Here are the four things. But wh why? Because God wants us to grow to His glory. In the last three classes, Brian covered uh, Josiah and uh, Je Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. And also he covered the book of Habakkuk on Wednesday. We are just flying through, and I love this kind of a study where we're just covering so much material and learning so much about the Bible in these four years, covering the whole thing. Let me put up a list here of the, these last six kings that we've looked at. Hezekiah, the great king of Judah, and, and uh, of course Israel fell while he was king, and so he spanned the divided kingdom in Judah alone. And then his son Manasseh, Manasseh was pretty bad, as bad as any king, uh, in fact probably worse than any king up until that point. Then Ammon, really bad. Then Josiah, really, 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 really good. Started king at age eight, reformed the land and everything. Uh, turned the people back to God. Then there was Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah. Jehoahaz was bad. Jehoahaz was removed from being king by whom? You remember who removed him? Egypt. All right, yes, Pharaoh Necho, king, king of uh, Pharaoh of Egypt, removed Jehoahaz and put another son of Josiah on the throne. So Jehoiakim is not the son of Jehoahaz, but he's another son of Josiah. All right? So you have Josiah, his two sons, Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim. And I don't really care if you remember all, all these names and everything, but I do want you to remember Jehoiakim. All right? In fact, if we could say it out loud, it'll help us to remember. Everybody say Jehoiakim. Jehoiakim. All right. That's right. And I think we're saying that right and not the Alabama way. Most of these Bible names I pronounce the Alabama way, but I think we're saying that one pretty close to right anyway. Um, we're really going to be talking about Jehoiakim some today and, and after today, so we need to be familiar with him. It is during his reign that what happens? Captivity. captivity begins. Captivity begins. The Babylonian captivity. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today in our, in our study is uh, the beginning of uh, the Babylonian captivity of the southern kingdom of Judah. And here's the main point that I'm going to be driving home over and over today. God does not make empty threats. Earlier in the Lord's Supper talk, I made the point that God does not make empty promises. I did it on purpose because I want us to look at both sides. God does not make empty promises. We can count on that. He also does not make empty threats. And we can bank on that as well. So it's going to be, I think, very practical for us and maybe sobering for us to, to study this material today. So we start out here talking about the first invasion, the beginning of the captivity. So Pharaoh Necho, as I said, had, uh, had deposed Jehoahaz from the throne and brought him to Egypt. He spends the rest of his life in Egypt and he dies there. And uh, Pharaoh Necho puts uh, Jehoiakim, that wasn't his original name, it was something else, it was Eliakim, but he gave him the name Jehoiakim and uh, made him pay tribute, but he was exceedingly wicked. Now before we learn more about Jehoiakim in the prophets, we need to kind of look at the world scene for a second. So. Uh, Egypt remained in power in that portion of the world. Now, I'm not going to kind of rehash this, but remember Brian talked about how Pharaoh Necho had, had gone up and helped Assyria up here to try to establish a stronghold in Haran, which they kind of failed in doing that. But in, in Egypt's effort here, what Egypt did is they established their own stronghold uh, all along the Mediterranean coast, all the way up to the Euphrates River from Egypt. So they were in control of all this land, which means they were in control of Judah. And Necho did not like Josiah's house, family, because of what Josiah had done, trying to stop him 
from, uh, from going and doing what he did uh, in, in helping uh, Assyria, and that's why he, uh, Josiah was killed. But anyway, uh, Pharaoh Necho is still in Carchemish. So he's not down in Egypt. He's up here in Carchemish on the Euphrates River trying to establish a stronghold uh, there. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar did not like this because Nebuchadnezzar, don't you know, he wanted control of all this land right here. Now, this is valuable area. This is a powerful area. Uh, anybody traveling through from the north would go through the land of Israel. And so it was a necessary area to control if you really wanted to be the world power. So uh, he comes and attacks the army of Egypt at Carchemish and drives them all the way back to Egypt. Right? It is at that point that uh, the king of Babylon, by the way, what was his name? Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar. Just call him Chad for short. <laughs> he, uh, we're not going to call him Chad for short. He, he found out that uh, his father had died. So he actually wasn't king at this point. His father was the king. When he found out his father had died, we know from history what he did was he headed out with a few of his men straight across the desert. That would be an easy trip. And in a hurry to get right back to the city of Babylon to take the throne. So he leaves, and he leaves his army in that area uh, so that they might uh, go through the, the area of, of Palestine and accept allegiances from the governments that were there, including Judah, which means that Jehoiakim became a vassal uh, to, to Babylon. So that kind of gives us a, a little bit of... Uh, background. Now let's read in 2 Kings 24, beginning of verse 1. In his days, talking about Jehoiakim, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his servant for three years. So he submitted to, to the king of Babylon for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. Why did he rebel against him? What was the mindset of the people of Judah at this time regarding Babylon and, and Nebuchadnezzar? What was the mentality? We don't want to submit to these people. What was Jeremiah's message? Submit to these people. That's what God is telling you to do. We don't want to do that. The king doesn't want to do that, so he rebels. Verse 3, the Lord sent against him bands of Chaldeans. Who are they? Who are Chaldeans? Babylonians. Okay. I, one time I called them the Chaldonians. <laughs> you just blend the two, the Chaldeans and the Chaldonians. That's the... Uh, or Chaldeans and the Babylonians, that's the Chaldonians. Uh, bands of Chaldeans, bands of Arameans, bands of Moabites, and bands of Ammonites. I mean, he's just getting pummeled. And it says, So he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he has spoken through his servants, the prophets. Prophets like Jeremiah. He said, if you, do this, if you rebel against the king of Babylon, it's going to be bad news. God's, God's going to destroy you. You want things to go well, submit to the king uh, of Babylon. And so, to kind of bring this back to the main point that I want to emphasize today, God does not make empty threats. He made the threat, and we see it begin to be carried out. We see that particular threat uh, carried out here with uh, the king of, uh, of Judah. Now, this is going to be kind of fun. We're going to go to Daniel for just a, a, a few minutes. So turn your Bibles to the book of Daniel. Now, what we're going to do now is we're just going to kind of introduce some things about the captivity. We're not going to delve into a study of the book of Daniel. We're going to do that next quarter, Lord willing. But I do want to kind of introduce a little bit about the captivity. Uh, let me just kind of pause here and make sure nobody has any questions or comments from that previous section. Does anybody have anything you'd like to uh, mention or ask at this point? All right, so Daniel chapter 1, if I can ever get there, I'm still in Ezekiel. Uh, Daniel chapter 1. Now, the year that the captivity began was what? Does, do y'all know what year? 605. Some people say 606, okay? Uh, a long, you know, not too long ago, but uh, traditionally preachers always said uh, 606 to 536. That was the captivity kind of makes it nice and clean, but it probably was more like 605 to 539. So I think 605 is more likely the, the date where this first phase of the captivity happens. That is a date I want you to remember. It's not hard to remember, but I want you to just kind of 
try to etch that in your brain and uh, remember 605 BC. All right, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar. Now that terminology reaches all the way back to the time of Noah, when his descendants migrated down to the plain of Shinar, which was between Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Okay, basically what we call Mesopotamia. Okay, so that's the area of Babylon, all right? Uh, it said that he brought these items from the house of God to the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. So he is, he is defiling these holy items by bringing them into his pagan uh, temple, right? God's going to judge him for all these things, of course. Verse 3, Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel. Now pay attention to this including some of the royal family and of the nobles, youths, in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them to teach him to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. We'll have a lot more to say about that uh, next quarter, but I just want to point out something here. When it mentions uh, the royal family, some of the royal family, what, what does that mean? Who are these descendants of? Yeah, David, right? The, the kings of Judah. In other words, uh, even from Hezekiah, these would have been descendants. Now, do you remember back when... Uh, Hezekiah, you know, after God spared his life, 15 years, and, and then uh, the, the king of Babylon heard about that, and he sent these messengers to kind of, you know, wish him well and kind of congratulate him that, he's, that he recovered and everything. Um, well, actually, he wanted to make an alliance is what he wanted to do. What did, what did Hezekiah do with those, with those Babylonian messengers? He received them. He showed them all of his treasures, and Isaiah rebuked him. For that, and here's what the Lord prophesied through Isaiah back uh, wherever that was, 2 Kings 20. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left, says the Lord. Some of your sons or your descendants who shall issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. It's pretty cool. That's a prophecy of what we're just reading about here in Daniel chapter 1. We see the fulfillment of that with these, with these people. So who was included in this group of captives that was taken? Well, uh, if you skip down to verse 6, it, men it mentions four people we know. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. You might say, I don't know who Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are. Yeah, you do. Who do you know them as? Yeah, Shadrach, Meshach. And Abednego, or as Stone used to say, Abednego. <laughs> it's Abednego. But, you know, uh, we'll talk more about that uh, next quarter, the fact that those names, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were actually the Babylonian names that they were given, which were named after Babylonian gods. We don't ever remember Daniel for his Babylonian name, which was Belteshazzar, the next verse tells us. Uh, but we always remember Daniel's three friends for their Babylonian names, but we don't remember them for their Jewish names, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So we'll try to memorize that and talk about that more uh, next quarter. All right, now I, I want to kind of make an important point here so that we're not confused. Here's our list of 17 Bible periods. I'm not going to take the time to just rehearse all of these. We're, we're familiar with all these. When you get to the two periods of Judah alone in captivity, we need to understand there is a, about a 20-year, actually it's 19 years, overlap between these two periods. Okay, Because the captivity didn't just happen in one year. And boom, captivity is over. You know, and, or Captivity has now just begun and Judah alone is just done. It was, a, it was a process, right? So the first captivity was in what year again? 605 B.C., right? <laughs> And uh, Jerusalem isn't destroyed until what year? 586. 586. That's 19 years later, right? So the process of, of the, the actual taking of the people from the land and everything is going to take 
19 years, and then the captivity is going to last several more decades after that. We'll talk more specifically about that in a minute. So you have about 20 years here where you have things going on in Babylon with the captivity, and, and people from Judah are there, and you've also got people in Judah, and you've got stuff going on there in Judah. So this 20-year overlap. So at this point, we're not really studying the captivity per se. We're just looking at the fact that it starts. For the rest of this quarter, we only have like four classes after today. We're going to be focusing on events that were continuing to happen in Judah while the captivity was happening. While Daniel and, and Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah are, are there in Babylon in the king's court and everything like that. Um, and what we'll do next quarter is we'll back up 20 years, 19 years, and we will then talk more specifically about the things that were happening in Babylon while Judah was still in existence uh, for, for those 19 years, okay? Just to kind of clarify some of that uh, for you. All right, now we're ready to move on. We're going to go to Jeremiah next. But does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? David? So the Ark of the Covenant is already gone by this time, or they would have mentioned that. That yes. they took it to Babylon. Yes. So it's gone. Yeah, we don't know, you know what happened to it. or So, yeah, uh, by this time, there's, there's no more mention of the ark. I forget where that was that we last, it was the last time we actually read about the ark, but uh, it, it's not going to be mentioned anymore. Uh, Good question. Oh, oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Harrison Ford, I mean, yeah. come on. Um, I really had a comment. Uh, would you call this? Period between the destruction of Jerusalem and the 605. Would you call that sort of a ramping up? They, they, they were trying. To, the king was trying to decide what to do, and so he would take some, and, and then you could see that one working, or he went more, or whatever. So was it ramping up or not? Ramping up, like the, until like the destruction. He finally got tired, and he said, "Boom! I'm, you know, I'm, I've had it." It's hard for me to to term it exactly. I mean, the feeling I get when I read the text is is. By this point, God is saying, look, destruction is inevitable. Like, it, it, is, it is going to happen. So in that sense, I don't, I guess you could say it was a ramping up to that final destruction. That's what I meant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I, I think that's, yeah, I think that's accurate. Taking more and more people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, ran, just leading up to that final, yeah, it was, it was just an evolution that all started with this first phase. And of course, the people, they didn't take this very seriously. No. You know, oh, it's not, it wasn't like a mass captivity. This was just the brightest, smartest, youngest, you know, people uh, of, of the group, young men, to go and serve in the king's court. The, the common people didn't feel much of the pain from that. And uh, so it's going to take a while for them to start taking this seriously. But, and to Herb's point, it just shows the patience of God that he's called them over and over. They didn't come out and just clean them up. Yeah. You know, I want to still, you know, like you're saying, 19, 20 years, I'm going to give you a chance to do what I've told you to do. Jeremiah and the prophet. They like to not finally, you know, we'll find out that that was the end of Yeah, yeah, that's a good, that's a really good way of putting it. You know, um, the captivity was going to happen, but things could have been easier on them if they would obey God. Like they, they could have, you know, they could have stayed in their homeland and still been under the uh, oppression of the king, but not necessarily had to all go to Egypt, that sort of thing, up to a certain point. You know, I don't know when kind of that last straw was, but uh, apparently it was kind of with Manasseh was the last straw. All right, now let's move forward to Jeremiah 25. So look in Jeremiah 25. <laughs> Jeremiah here predicts the captivity, which he's done many times, so that's not unusual, but he does something specific and unusual, very unique in this particular prophecy. Jeremiah 25. We're going to start in verse 3. I don't know where Jeremiah is, if he's in the temple. You know, a lot of times God would tell him to go into the court of the temple uh, and deliver these kinds of messages. One time he, w he went to the, the valley of Tophet or uh, the valley of uh, the son of Hinnom, right? Uh, Gehenna. And uh, to, to preach there. But wherever he is, I just try to picture him. He's standing here and he's preaching. He's got the inhabitants of Jerusalem there. And I just kind of picture them standing there with their arms crossed, you know, with frowns on their faces, listening to this crazy preacher guy up here. I'm kind of used to that, right? Not, not, not the arms crossed thing, but the crazy preacher part. Verse 3, he says, From the thirteenth year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, even to this day, 
These 23 years the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken to you again and again, but you have not listened. I just kind of picture him pointing his finger. And the Lord has sent to you all his servants, the prophets, again and again, but you have not listened, nor inclined your ear to hear, saying, Turn now everyone from his evil way and from the evil of your deeds, and dwell on the land which the Lord has given to you and your forefathers forever and ever. Look at what God wants here. He wants them to stay on the land. Verse 6, And do not go after other gods to serve them and to worship them, and do not provoke me to anger with the work of your hands, and I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, declares the Lord, in order that you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Let's pause here for a second. There's a lot here. Let me ask you three questions. Number one, what do we learn about God here? What do we learn about God in this passage? He's compassionate. He's compassionate. What else is He? He's, jealous. He's patient. He's jealous. And uh, I wanted to emphasize the patience point. Like Joe was just saying a second ago, um, God, you know, He sent prophet after prophet. He, he, he took years of warning the people before He finally brought down His hand of judgment, right? God is patient. He's patient with us. Doesn't 2 Peter 3 talk about the patience of God? Right? And why is God being patient to allow this earth to continue spinning, to continue existing? So that people might repent, right? That's, that's God's patience. That's why He hasn't come and destroyed this world yet. He's waiting, giving people more opportunity to, uh, to turn to Him. Second question, what do we learn about choice from this passage that we just read? It's ours? What did, what did the Jews choose? They chose the judgment. Think about that. It was their choice. God didn't want it to happen. If we reject God and we get punished because of that, is God sending us to hell? I mean, really, in the end, God doesn't send people to hell. We kind of send ourselves there if we reject God. We choose that path. Third question, what do we learn about their attitude towards God's threats? And take it seriously. They just totally dismissed it. Do we? Because God does not make empty threats. He does not make empty threats. Continuing, verse 8, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, Because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send and take all the families of the north, declares the Lord, and I will send to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, my servant, look at that, my servant, and will bring them against this land and against its inhabitants and against all these nations round about, and I will utterly destroy them and make them a horror and a hissing and an everlasting desolation. I mean, this is, this is bad. <laughs> Verse 10, Moreover, I will take from them the voice of joy and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land will be a desolation and a horror. And these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. There's a lot here, but I want to emphasize just a couple of things. First of all, what did he mean when he called Nebuchadnezzar, the prideful, arrogant king of Babylon, his servant? How was Nebuchadnezzar the servant of Jehovah? He's going to be used for God's purpose. Do you remember somebody else that God called his servant who was not actually a true servant of, of God? In Isaiah 44, at the end of 44, beginning of 45. Anybody happen to know who I'm talking about? Brian, you know, it was Cyrus. Called Cyrus, my servant. That would be later in the return from captivity. And so Nebuchadnezzar is going to fulfill the will of God by bringing judgment. Um, and that, in that sense, he's God's servant. And then there's the mention there in verse 11 of the length. What's the length of time that this captivity will last? 70 years. 70 years. That's the unique aspect of this prophecy. There's many, as I said, prophecies of the captivity that have been made up to this point, but this is the first time that we see a time element placed on it. And we see this repeated in chapter 29 of Jeremiah, and um, 
You know what's something that's really cool? That's really just neat. Hold your Bibles here and turn to Daniel chapter 9. We're kind of fast forwarding. Actually, we're fast forwarding 70 years, is how far we're fast forwarding. Look in Daniel 9. I was just going to mention this, but I want, you to, I want you to read it with me. All right, so it's talking about the first year of, uh, of Darius. It says, In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, observed in the books the number of the years which was revealed as the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet for the completion of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Isn't that neat? Just imagine, here's Daniel. He's got access to the, the scrolls of Jeremiah. Right? It wouldn't have all fit in one scroll. <laughs> And he's reading, and he comes across Jeremiah chapter 25. Of course, it wasn't divided into chapters. It could have also been maybe Jeremiah 29. I'm not sure which one. But he's reading, and he comes along, oh, 70 years? And then Daniel whips out his calendar, and he goes, hey, it's been about 70 years. That means the captivity is almost over. And Daniel starts praying about that, and soon enough, the, uh, the captivity is over, the return from captivity uh, begins and all of that. And it's, that is so faith-building to me, that this 70-year prophecy. You know, it's just so specific. As Brian talked about, I think, Wednesday, maybe Sunday, vague prophecies are not very impressive. But this prophecy is just so specific, 70 years. Is there some symbolism to 70, maybe? Yes. How? The spiritual number is complete. Okay. Seven is kind of a number of perfection, you might say. Ten is a number of completion. You've got ten fingers, ten toes. Seven times ten is seventy. And so just a, a full, complete period, right, of time that God is going to allow this captivity uh, to, uh, to happen. In other words, it's not going to last forever. It's not going to last forever. There's going to be the return from captivity to come. All right, now let's continue our reading in verse 12. Jeremiah continues, Then it will be, when 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans. And I will make it an everlasting desolation. I will bring upon that land all my words, which I have pronounced against it, and all that is written in the book, which Jeremiah has prophesied against all the nations. So, again, amazing. The prophecy doesn't end with the captivity. It goes on to say, oh yeah, and after the captivity, I'm going to totally destroy Babylon as well. Who could have ever guessed that? Who, who would have ever been up? Nobody would have known that. Babylon, the, the world power, they're going to be crushed. In fact, in Jeremiah 51, Jeremiah says that, uh, that Babylon will become, do you remember his term? A what? Heap of ruins. Remember that sermon I did a couple of months ago? I showed you that picture of Babylon. You know what it looks like? Today is a heap of ruins. So Faith building. And another thing that's impressive too, um, Babylon, though Babylon originally teamed up with the Medes, right? The Medo-Persian Empire, uh, what it later became known as. Uh, uh, we, we read in chapter 51 and verse 11 that the nation that will punish Babylon was the Medes. So he even tells what nation is going to, to destroy Babylon. Very specific, very impressive. So to come back to our original point, uh, God does not make empty threats. And we're seeing the beginning, the unfolding of these threats. Any thoughts or questions before we move to, uh, I'm going faster than I meant, so feel free. We can take a few minutes here if anybody has anything you want to throw in. Start with anybody who hasn't made any comments yet. Anybody have anything you want to say? Any questions? <coughs> Anybody else that already has spoken? The floor is open. You are killing me. When the Bible says, uh, you know, God is, God is love, it reminds me <clears throat> when the passage in Corinthians, it hopes all things, it bears all things, it endures all things. It, that's God. He's, he's doing that with his people over and over. It's yeah. the definition of love. Absolutely. I mean, when people say that, well, the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath. They just haven't really understood the Old Testament. He only brings down wrath when he has to because his people are so rebellious. His heart is not a heart of wrath. It is a heart of love. That's, that's a great point. 
fact, we learn about God's love in the Old Testament in some ways more vividly than we do in the New Testament. Some of the language about God's forgiveness, you know, and separating our transgressions as far as the east is from the west, and things like that. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll move forward now. Let's talk about the example of the Rechabites. All right, go to chapter 35. I love this story. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? It's, I just wish my kids are like this. You know, I want my kids to be like this is what I'm saying. Um, verse 1, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go to the house of the Rechabites and speak to them, and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers, and give them wine to drink. Now this is kind of an odd command. I want you to invite these people, the Rechabites, pretty specific, take them to one of the chambers of the temple, I'll show you a picture of that in a second, and give them wine. It's a three-part command. Do you think Jeremiah knew they were supposed to give I don't have any indication that he knows. I have an, I, all I know is God told him this, and I get the sense that Jeremiah is just kind of like, okay, you tell me to do this, I'll go, you know, we don't need to question when God tells us what to do. We don't understand why. We just need to do it. Uh, maybe he did understand, but I get the feeling maybe he didn't. But anyway, here's a cross section of the, the, the uh, temple of Solomon. You see here on the side, these chambers, uh, they were seven and a half feet wide. I don't know how long they were. I don't know how tall they were, but big enough that you could fit in and um, store stuff in and stuff like that. So it was in one of these chambers, that, there were chambers like this on both sides, that he would, he would take these men in. And apparently they don't know why they've been invited, just, you know, hey, the Lord told me to invite you. And so they come and they, they meet in this uh, chamber and he sets wine before them to drink. By the way, just to reiterate what I've said many times, wine of the Bible days is, is very different from wine of today. It did not even have to be alcoholic to be called wine. I mean, many times it was alcoholic, but not nearly as intoxicating as the wine of today. In fact, most of the time it was heavily diluted. Okay? So we're not to understand that he's setting before them something that if they drink, they're just going to get absolutely you, you know, wiped out. But, uh, but anyway, he does offer them wine uh, to drink. And look at their response in verse 6. But they said, We will not drink wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, saying, You shall not drink wine. You were your sons forever. Now, first of all, I mean, there's a great point to make there about alcohol, right? Just, it's set before you. You don't have to feel awkward about it. You don't have to feel obligated. You can just say, No, I, I, don't, I don't drink. Verse 7, you shall not build a house, and you shall not sow seed. This is further what uh, uh, their father, Jonadab, had told them. You shall not build a house, and you shall, you shall not sow seed, and you shall not plant a vineyard or own one. But in tents you shall dwell all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. A very wise thing. So that this two-part kind of command, number one, don't drink any wine at all. And uh, just don't touch it. Just abstain from it altogether. And then the second part was, I want you people to be, I want you, you my sons, to be pilgrims. Uh, you and your descendants. You're just going to be pilgrims. You're not going to settle in one area. And the reason is why? At the end of verse 7. Live many days in the land. So you'll live many days in the land. All right? So he sees this as something that's going to help them. And I'm not really going to get into that because I'm going to leave that for Brian. He's really going to take this passage and, and uh, use this passage in his sermon to talk about uh, the, uh, the fact that we are pilgrims, that we are strange, and I don't want to kind of steal his thunder. He's going to make some great points from that. But I want to emphasize really the, the main point that this is all heading toward in this text. Go down to verse 12. Uh, he, he's, well, so anyway, they, they continue to tell him, uh, Jeremiah, uh, look, we we're not going to do this. We're committed to obey what our Father said, and that's what we've, we've done. That's what we're going to continue to do. Then verse 12, Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction by listening to my words, declared the Lord? The words of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, which he commanded his sons not to drink wine, are observed. So they do not drink wine to this day. 
for they have obeyed their father's command, but I have spoken to you again and again. And he goes on to kind of repeat what he said back in chapter 25. I've sent, you know, God has sent prophet after prophet. You've rejected the word of the Lord. You've not listened. And so God has no choice but to absolutely punish you in verse 17. So again, we're kind of back to our original point that God does not make empty threats. He's threatened it and now he's, uh, he's doing it. But I just love this point that Jeremiah makes that, look, look at this contrast. You, you've got these, these men who are obeying their father to never drink wine and to be pilgrims all their days, yet the children of God won't obey His command. It reminds me of Isaiah 1, where Isaiah talks about that, uh, you know, the ox knows his owner and the donkey knows its master. My, my people don't know. My people don't know me. It's just, it's just backwards. You, know, you think of people today that they will listen to their boss and they'll do anything their boss says to keep their job and, and so forth, but they won't listen to God. Or people today that they might do anything that would make their boyfriend or girlfriend happy, to please their boyfriend or girlfriend, to keep them in the relationship, but they won't listen to God or try to please Him. So let us not be that way. All right, any thoughts or questions on this before I kind of bring it home and, and really drive home the application for us? Yeah, anything from the, from the Rechabites? I know there's a lot there. No, I, I, we, that's good though. I will. Let's look, let's look at that. Verse 18 and following. Uh, then Jeremiah said to the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father, kept all his commands, and done according to all that he commanded you, therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab the son of Rechab shall not lack a man to stand before me always. And so God was honoring them. Uh, and he saw that as a, a, a wonderful thing. And we need to see it that way as well. That kind of commitment, that kind of obedience to our parents, that uh, God sees that as a wonderful thing. All right, anything else y'all want to point out from, from this story? Everybody's tired today because of the time change. <laughs> yeah, I just realized it. That's what's going on. Y'all are, are tired, and, and I'm, I'm tired too. I can understand that. Especially if I had to sit and listen to me, I would just get more and more tired. What does he mean when he says, shall not lack a man to stand before me always? Uh, well, it's just kind of vague, but it's, it's kind of the idea, I think, that God would preserve that family. And th these people, n not only are they obedient to their father, but they're standing, as it were, before the Lord. And so I think the idea is they're also committed to the Lord, and God's going to preserve them. Yeah. I, if I understand that correctly. Anybody understand that differently? I agree. Yeah. Herb agrees. I'm good. All right. So let's bring it home. I want to come back to our main point. Imagine if all who claim to follow God in this world if all who claim the name of Christ in this world, all the denominations, all the non-denominations, all the groups of people that don't call themselves anything because they're in a third world country meeting under a tree, all who claim God, imagine if they all, imagine if we all took God's warnings seriously. Imagine. I want you to think about it. What are some of the warnings in the New Testament that are given to, to us? Don't be slight concerning time. Okay. Is that what you're thinking about? Yes, yes. So uh, are you thinking of uh, like, like Ephesians where he talks about uh, redeeming the time? Uh, yes, okay, redeem the time. And I, am, I, I guess I'm thinking more specifically about if we don't do this or that, here's the negative consequences. What kind of warnings can you think about? There should be some obvious ones that come to your, to your mind in the New Testament. I mentioned one was <coughs> Sir? Those who don't believe God will be thrown into the Yeah, yeah. 2 Thessalonians 1. Those who do not obey God, those who do not uh, 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 believe God and obey the gospel yes. will be punished with everlasting destruction, destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. Uh, when he comes in that day to be glorified among his saints and so forth. Yeah, absolutely. I wrote an article about this too. So if, if you want to look at the cheat sheet, I've got a list of, of some warnings. 
that are there. Uh, I'm just kidding, y'all don't actually have to look at the cheat sheet, but uh, let me mention one or two. I didn't have this one in, in the article, but how about the warning in Revelation 22, 17, and 18? Y'all remember what that warning is? Don't add and don't take away. Now, that's specifically talking about the book of Revelation. If you add to it, if you take away from it, what's going to happen if you add to it? God's going to add the plagues that are written in the book to you. If you take away from it, what's going to happen? He's going to take your name away from the book of life. Now, what if everyone who claimed God the world over took that warning dead seriously? Don't add, don't take away, or we will be judged and our name will be removed from the list of the saved. You think that would make a difference? You think there would be less false doctrine? You think there would be less division? If we took that dead serious, don't add, don't take away. I'd like to think we here take that seriously. But let me hit us with another one that may be a little bit more personal to us. What about when Jesus commanded, or He warned in the Sermon on the Mount, that if we don't forgive others of their trespasses, that our Heavenly Father will not forgive our trespasses. If we took that warning seriously, we would bend over backward to forgive our brethren. We would not hold grudges. Even if we had the right to hold a grudge, we would say, well, I may have the right to do that. Maybe they didn't really repent. Maybe they deserve something worse. You know what? I'm just going to give them tons and tons and tons of grace because I am desperate for God's forgiveness. If we took that warning more seriously in the church, we would stop placing so much emphasis on doctrine and would start placing more emphasis on love. We need to place emphasis on doctrine. I'm all about that. But sometimes we place the emphasis on doctrine to the exclusion of love. And that's because we're failing to take God's warning seriously. He will not forgive us. We can argue about doctrine until we're red in the face, but if we're not forgiving our brethren, the whole thing's a waste. We're lost. Because without God's forgiveness, we got nothing. You know, Matthew 7, do not judge so that you will not be judged. By the measure you judge, by that same measure you will be judged. If we are harsh and critical with others, the warning God gives us is He will be harsh and critical with us. Are we going to stand a chance in the day of judgment if He's harsh and critical with us? We don't have a hope. Take His warnings seriously. Let it change your behavior. Let it change your behavior. That's all I got. So y'all have the floor for two minutes, so y'all help me out here. Ms. Catherine? I remember the, the first time I attended a few years ago here um, at PSD, the Brian was doing a sermon on um, just do the next right thing. Mm. And it was, uh, it really was to me all encompassing because it just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. So it, it just, to me, it, it covers everything. Just do that next right thing mm -hmm. and then everything else falls in place. You don't worry about down here, mm -hmm. just worry about this next thing you're doing. I love that. And that, that sermon has always stayed with me and I, and I think about it a lot. Do the next right thing. Well, that, that says a lot about that sermon of Brian, if you remember it all these you know, months, years really later. So, uh, yeah, and I love that point. It's, that is so true uh, for us in our life. It's pretty overwhelming to follow Jesus. You know, following Jesus is more difficult. I'll get to you, Miss Debbie. Uh, sorry, I say miss because I'm from Alabama. I know it makes some of y'all feel old when I do that. Um, I don't mean that. Um, following the commands of Jesus are more difficult than following the Old Testament. Jesus didn't come to make it easier. He gave more challenging commands than even they had to follow in the, old, in, in the Old Testament. So it can be overwhelming, but just do the next right thing. I love that. Debbie? For me, I, I always pray for more faith because it's, it's a faith issue to me. It's, sometimes it's all too wonderful or too frightening or too to fully wrap your brain around God's promises and God's threats. Yeah. And so I always pray that I have more faith to believe more because 
to take it if you if you fully believe you're going to take it seriously. Absolutely. So for me, it's like yeah. I think that to myself. My faith isn't strong enough if I'm not. That's a really great point. And it shows the practical aspect of faith being the center of the gospel. It, everything revolves around that. If we don't really have faith, we're not really believing the promises. We're not really believing the warnings. It's not just believe that Jesus came and died for you. It's more than that. It's believing everything uh, deeply. And that's a great point to just pray for more, for more faith. All right. Thanks for helping me out a little bit there at the end. Um, Please read through page 165A for Wednesday.